I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and behind me I've got one of my favourite sedans to review today. This is the Alfa Romeo Giulia, and hasn't it been given a stunning facelift? Facelifts usually don't improve the look of a car, generally speaking, but I think Alfa Romeo has done a really nice job on this late in life update to the Giulia. Now, I reviewed a gorgeous green over tan Giulia Veloce back in 2021, and I loved that car. So, what's changed apart from the styling? Well, the specification has actually been cut back a bit on this Giulia Veloce, but the Alpha has a real ace up its sleeve. It is 20 grand cheaper than its key rivals, the BMW 330i and the Mercedes-Benz C300. But there's a little bit more detail to add to that factoid, which I'll go into next. Before we get started, hit subscribe below. Chasing Cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. I know that to talk about price seems to ignore all of the abundant emotional appeal of an Alfa Romeo Giulia, and I promise you I'll come back to that in a sec. But I've got to start by making sure you're aware of just how much more affordable this vehicle is than cars that, at least a couple of years ago, we would have considered key rivals. Let's go back to 2021, where we're still mid-COVID pandemic and big inflation hadn't kicked in in Australia yet. At that point, the Giulia Veloce was $71,000 before on-road costs, a BMW 330i was 74, a Mercedes C300 was 75. Now, since that point, we've had about 12% inflation here in Australia. So by rights, the Giulia Veloce should cost about 80 grand, and the Merc and the BMW should cost 84 or 85. So what's actually happened? Well, the Giulia is only $74,000 now, so it's actually about six grand less than it should have been by rights, whereas the BMW and the Mercedes are both $95,000. So that means that this car is now 20 grand cheaper than its German rivals, and even in real terms, it is at least 10 grand more affordable with the same purchasing power as you would have had back in 2021. So that is staggering. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. And part of the reason why this car has stayed more affordable is that it's also been despecified. It's hard to remember that when the facelift looks so good and the Julia is so inviting. But just two things that this car has lost since it received a very positive review from me two years ago is the seats have been despec'd from 12-way to 10-way, and I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. And it's also lost adaptive dampers on the Veloce, which is a bit of a shame, but not a deal breaker. Again, I'll return to that point. Let's chat about the interior. Fundamentally, it is very similar to Julia's that have come before it in this generation. There's been a bit of a technology bump with digital instruments for the driver. We used to have handsome analog gauges, but the retro character has actually been retained in software and these look great and are very functional. Over here, we've still got an 8.8 inch touchscreen. The resolution's a bit low. It's matte coated, so it looks a little bit, I guess, jaggy compared to some other screens and the CarPlay and Android Auto requires a cable so the Julia is starting to feel a bit old now. It is in its eighth year on sale so that makes sense. We do have a Harman Kardon 14 speaker premium stereo on the Veloce though and that sounds really good and material quality as a rule is excellent. Lovely leather steering wheel, real aluminium paddle shifters which are just gorgeous to use, leather on the dash, leather on the doors, everything in here feels properly premium. It doesn't feel 20 grand cheaper than a 330i. In some ways, it actually feels more expensive. The Veloce's sports seats with power bolsters are gorgeously upholstered too. We've got conservative black in this car. You can also get red leather in the Veloce. Sadly, the tan leather that we saw two years ago has been deleted, which really um, bothers me personally as has the green paint. The green over tan was absolutely gorgeous. You can't do anything that interesting anymore, but the fundamentals are still solid. Lovely aluminium trim. The controls all feel well damped and high quality. The Julia got a big quality bump in about 2018 or 19, I think, and that's all remained. Big cup holders, actually decent storage for an Italian car as well. Decent sized door bins, but where do things go wrong? Well, it goes wrong in terms of the driving position if you have long legs. The reason for that is because Alpha has mind-bogglingly removed under-thigh adjustment from the Veloce. You never got it on the base model, Julia, in the past, which was bad enough for a premium car. But at least with the Veloce, you could get the seat base to an angle which supported your legs. And if you've got longer legs, you'll notice this. 
In my previous Giulia Veloce video with 12 way seats, I noted that the driving position was perfect. Sadly, that's no longer the case because my legs are floating in air because there's no adjustment in the under thigh on the seat. Now, technically you could probably get this done aftermarket. You could maybe have the entire seat's angle reset and like permanently reset, but you shouldn't have to do that. Every single one of this car's rivals have proper levels of adjustment for the seat. And it's sad to see that Alfa eliminated this important feature. Moving to the back seat now, even though cars in this segment are typically not used as family cars in modern Australia, the Giulia can do it if you don't have a driving position that's too far back. Mine is relatively close to the steering wheel for someone of my height, which is about six feet, and I fit behind myself just fine. Headroom, even with the dual pane sunroof, I've got half an inch or an inch, so acceptable. Legroom's good. Toe room's a little bit constricted with the front seat in its lowest setting, but it's totally livable and bearable back here, and there's actually better under thigh support in the back seat than in the front seat, which is kind of funny. One thing that has also been cut out of the Giulia Veloce from the last time we saw the car is the heated rear seats. Probably not a feature that would have been used that often, to be fair. Rear air vents still feature, and you still get an old school USB-A port back here, plus matte pockets in the seat backs, and a flip down armrest with two and a half cup holders. And these back seats still fold 40-20-40, which is a good level of practicality. One sad thing about the Alfa Romeo Giulia reboot is that it never got a station wagon version. Older Alfa wagons like the 156 and 159 were really good looking things, but the Giulia remained steadfastly sedan only. Now, if you like a quick sedan, this will be perfect for you. And of course, the Alfa Stelvio is kind of like a lifted Giulia wagon, isn't it? But I think most of us would agree the styling of this car is just gorgeous. The facelift's given it another lift, and actually these telephone dial wheels are now standard. Going into the boot behind the new Alfa Romeo badge, subtly restyled, the aperture is very narrow, so you're not going to be able to get bulky things in here easily. But the amount of actual room on offer in simple volume, 480 litres, is competitive with a 3 Series A4 C-Class. Underneath the boot floor, you're not going to find a spare, um, which does slightly limit your confidence in terms of touring on pockmarked country roads. But this car is so good to drive, you kind of want to take the risk anyway. But a space saver would naturally be better. Manual tailgate but it's very easy to close. When it comes to running costs, the Giulia is not the cheapest vehicle in the segment to service, but it's also not the most expensive. That would be the Mercedes-Benz C300 by quite a long way. By contrast, the Giulia Veloce will cost you $2,865 to service for the first five years, 75,000 Ks, and that is a capped amount. Since we last met a Giulia Veloce, Alfa has thankfully improved its warranty. It used to be three years, 150,000 kilometers, strange interval for three years. It's now five years unlimited kilometers, matching the Merc, the BMW, the Audi, so that's great to see. In terms of insurance, over the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer spent $1,265 to comprehensively insure a new Alfa Romeo Giulia. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live, your driving history and how you garage the car. And lastly, when it comes to fuel consumption, this thing's got a bit of power from its two liter turbo petrol, so we don't expect the world of it, but its urban consumption is on the thirsty side. I saw 12.8 liters per 100 Ks, it's a red alpha. Maybe you do drive it a bit more assertively than most. On the highway, expect maybe around seven for a combined figure of just under 10. So now we come to what a lot of people would regard as the best part of an Alfa Romeo Giulia. The value proposition is pretty good. The styling is pretty good. Even the interior is pretty nice. But this vehicle is all about the driving experience. I think in this class, the BMW 330i is also pretty strong as far as driving dynamics go, but as we've already been through, that car's simply much more expensive than a Julia now. So for this price, 74 plus on road costs, I think that it is very, very difficult to beat the dynamics of a Julia in any car in any segment. Of course, there will be some exceptions and you can let me know what they are in the comments, but the Julia is incredibly sophisticated at this price point. And a lot of that is about the ride and handling, which I'll come to in a moment. But first of all, let's talk about the powertrain. It's a two litre turbocharged petrol four cylinder engine. It makes 200 kilowatts of power, 400 Newton meters of torque. It's a very serviceable engine. 
it's between this and the BMW B48 for probably best engine in the class. I think the Audi's EA888 2.0-litre turbo is also a good one, but either way, there's definitely much, much more spirit and sparkle in the Audi's engine than the Mercedes C300 powertrain, which is actually a, a bit workmanlike. It's rear-wheel drive only, and if you go for the Giulia Veloce, as we've got here, you do get a Q2 LSD limited slip differential on the rear axle, which is gonna help you put down the power while you're mid-corner, and that's a real characteristic of the way the Giulia Veloce drives. Transmission-wise, we've got an eight-speed torque converter made by ZF. This is a well-known transmission. But just having the ZF transmission is one thing. The software tune that you run through it is quite another. And Alpha has done a brilliant job on the software for the ZF 8-speed. It is an imperceptible transmission when you've got the car in N mode, which is natural mode. But when you put it into dynamic, it's like a sixth sense. You know, it, it's approaching a Porsche PDK for just how slick the transmission feels when you are driving the car hard and you just want it to be making the right calls. Of course, you can take over yourself and you can drive through these beautiful, real, cold aluminium paddles, which is a nice sensory experience too, and the transmission is perfectly responsive through the paddle shifters. In terms of the noise, to be honest with you, it sounds like a two liter turbo petrol four cylinder. If there's one area where I would have liked to have seen a bit more extra version from the Giulia Veloce, it would have been a sportier exhaust tune, but we haven't seen that come along in the life of the car. It's a noticeable difference between the Giulia Veloce and the Quadrifoglio, which is like double the price, but that car has a gorgeous 2.9 liter V6 and a really, really cool exhaust tune. Still, even though the Giulia Veloce is not loud, it's not overstated in terms of its exhaust, it is absolutely glorious in terms of its ride handling balance. It's not quite as good as it once was. Two years ago, this car still had adaptive dampers. They've now been stripped out and they're only on the Quadrifoglio. Unfortunately, you can't even add them as an option on the Veloce. But unlike some cars in this segment, including the BMW 3 Series, which are a bit disappointing on their standard suspension, the Giulia is still really good even on passive dampers it was just great on adaptive dampers. So probably 10, 15% of polish and compliance has come off with the removal of the adaptive damper, but it's no deal breaker. I would still happily live with this car on passive suspension, which is not something that I say all the time where the option is available. The reason for that is the basic mechanical package for the suspension of this car is fantastic. We've got a double wishbone front end, of course got multi-link independent rear suspension, but the calibration and the setup of the hardware is so well done and sophisticated that the Julia just has inherent compliance baked into the platform that allows it to soak up difficult mid-corner bumps on badly surfaced Australian B-roads just like this one without clanging and banging through to the cabin. There's so much inherent capability in this car that you can really drive it quite hard and it will just forgive you each time and find traction, it'll find grip and there's still seemingly suspension travel to go even though it doesn't sit awkwardly high and it doesn't roll too much in the corners it's really beautifully done and famously the former head of FCA as it then was Sergio Marchione knocked back the fully finished Giulia years before this car came out because it wasn't good enough for his standards Alpha had to start from scratch and come up with the car that Marchioni would approve, and that's what we're in now. And with this car, you just get a very, very strong sense that it went through considerable iteration before they found the one. And I think that's why this car is eight years old, but it still feels incredibly fresh, incredibly competent, because Alpha really got it right, and it's kind of criminally offensive that it hasn't sold very well despite that. The steering too is almost a definition of what good steering in a modern car is. I think it's really between something like this and an ND MX-5 or a Porsche 911 for great modern steering. It's a quick rack, but it's more about the feel and the feedback and the precision that you get through the wheel, an effect which is largely matched by the precision that you're able to extract from the chassis through the throttle, because even though we don't have a stability control sport mode on this car, which would be lovely. If you put it into dynamic mode, the stability control system allows you more leeway and you're able to get the rear end involved while you're cornering, not to a Larry degree, but just to a degree that can relieve some pressure on the front wheels and let you really engage with this beautifully balanced chassis uh, very well indeed. 
it's an incredibly natural communicative car to drive and just a joy from the commute through to a road like this it is one of these cars which you'll find an excuse to drive and that's something that i absolutely love about the julia but there are some flaws refinement isn't generally one of them the road noise and the wind noise is actually very well suppressed in this car but quality control is a problem for the particular vehicle that i'm driving now interestingly i've never really found a quality problem with the julia's or the stelvio's that we've tested in years gone by but this car feels like a friday afternoon car a bit of a dud you may be able to hear some of the sounds on this recording the instrument binnacle in front of me is rattling terribly on this not even that bad of course chip but not that bad country road there's a shocking creak in this vehicle from somewhere out back i think it is either the rear glass or a latch for the folding rear seats i've heard it all week it's worsened throughout the week but i haven't been able to solve it as I say, this is the first Julia I've tested with issues like this, but it has detracted a bit from the serenity throughout the week. I've solved these problems by turning up the Harman Kardon, to be honest, because the stereo is really good. But there's also other niggling issues, like the fact there's no custom drive mode. In a car like this, it'd be nice to have the powertrain response of dynamic, the stability control of dynamic, without the heavy steering of dynamic. But that's not a combination that you can have because you have to choose advanced efficiency, natural, or dynamic mode. There is no custom mode in this vehicle, which is a bit of a shame. But that's basically it. Almost everything else about the Julia, from the powertrain to the handling to the ride, is an absolute delight. And at the price of this vehicle compared to rivals in 2023, I think it's a steal. So that's my opinion on the facelifted Alfa Romeo Giulia Veloce for 2023. This vehicle is no longer really the match for the likes of the 3 Series or the C-Class on specification, but it's so much more affordable and it's so excellent to drive. The only car that can touch the Giulia for driving dynamics in this sort of compact premium sedan segment is a BMW 330i. That car is $94,000 before on-road costs. The Alpha is 74, so you can start to see why it puts together a very compelling case for itself, even if the spec is more austere than it was when we loved the pre-facelift version in green two years ago. In many ways, I still reckon the Julia is a car you have to consider if you're shopping in this part of the market. But what do you think? Do you have a Julia? Are you thinking about buying one? Let me know down below in the comments. While you're there, hit subscribe and the notification bell. Feel free to share this video with someone that might find it useful. And as always, thank you for watching Chasing Cars.